uh, as Katie said, we're going to uh, hear from Tom, Tom Lee, who's the uh, founder and CEO of, of One Medical. I'm really excited to, to have uh, Tom here. Uh, it really represents um, uh, an interesting combination of both technology and design that he has been <clears throat> put together, and he'll tell you his story, creating this in 2007, uh, to elevate the experience of primary care. Um, the company has done really amazingly well. They've raised over $100 million uh, in funding. I think they're in seven different locations now. Uh, turns out that both Katie and I are <laughs> members uh, of One Medical, and we're huge supporters. Uh, and Spencer may be in the audience, too, who's my awesome doctor uh, as well. So. Welcome, Tom. Uh, we've got half an hour or so, uh, a lot of slides to get through, but um, hopefully there's some sort of time for Q&A and we'll just sort of uh, see how things go. But can we be give a big round to uh, Tom Lee, please? Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. This is great. I mean, I think um, we're at this amazing uh, convergence of innovation and healthcare. Um, and now we're also seeing the demographic shift, and so this conference is really a fantastic confluence of really um, some real macro trends um, hitting the market, and it's nice to be able to kind of uh, chat and communicate and learn more about the space. Um, I'm here to tell you about my story within the innovation space of primary care, um, and this should generally apply to you, whether you're an uh, owner of multiple residential facilities or you're an entrepreneur in the sense that uh, design in healthcare is a challenge, and there's a way through that, but it does require some thinking, um, and, and it's possible. And uh, what's great about uh, healthcare, it's a huge opportunity to really apply a creative mind uh, to a really big and tough problem. Uh, briefly about my background, um, I started originally as a clinician. I, I focused on going into general medicine, academic primary care, and uh, this was the inspiration for why I went into medicine. It was really just kind of the concept that we all have about what healthcare should be. It's about individualized patient care, observing, listening, attending to the care of an individual patient. And really, this was the inspiration for uh, myself and a lot of peers who go into medicine. Um, and I did my medical training uh, in Seattle, and so I did uh, my care up in rural Alaska and Montana as part of the, you know, the program in my medical training. And I also did my training out in Boston in residency uh, at an academic medical center. And what was fairly consistent, no matter what setting I was practicing in, is you had great providers, great individuals trying to care for patients, but there was something prohibiting uh, an idealized notion of what care should be. It was very disconnected from the vision. And I would broadly call this kind of uh, system, the healthcare system applied on top of what we imagined healthcare should be. Um, and it was this mysterious force that made no sense to anybody uh, delivering the care, but uh, there was a real problem that uh, most of us could feel. And really, at this stage, uh, I became frustrated, and um, you know, I, I was just a, a resident physician <laughs> with very little training outside of medical skills, and, uh, and I said, there's got to be a better way to figure out how the system works and how to make it better. So really, um, that began my journey, is to try to figure out why the system is so complicated and bizarre and how to make it better. Um, the only place to start is to kind of put on your uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, hat and start to really dig and research and figure it out. And th so that's kind of what I thought I'd do, is I'd start to understand what was going on in healthcare. And knowing that I was a medical resident, it was probably more comical, so maybe it was really more of an Inspector Clouseau mindset. But I was really kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what, what is going on in healthcare and why is it so bad. And at the end of the day, it's still the same principles of being a great clinician, which is observation, right? Look at what's going on in the current system and how could we make it better. And so what I did was I just looked at all the practice settings that I'd worked in, and they were amazingly consistently broken, right? You saw chaotic uh, front desks, enormous number of people running around with paper, uh, a lot of chaos and, and busyness, um, and a lot of frustration by both the staff and the patients. Uh, if you kind of looked at a much more macroscopic lens, what was also clear is the individual providers worked in small settings, and in the context of healthcare, they were being shifted around by enormous forces really outside of their control. So uh, to a primary care clinician or a practitioner in small group practice, they were really a small boat on an ocean that was really moving around quite turbulently, and particularly so over the last several years with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, from a macro lens, it's pretty clear, right? We've seen this trend, healthcare inflation, makes no sense, right? Disproportionate to kind of all other aspects in, in uh, any other country comparison. And 
from an output perspective, we know that quality is still mixed, right? The variability of care and the reliability of kind of what we deliver as outputs is poor. So at a macroeconomic level, you could really just step outside of the healthcare system and say, hey, we have enormous inputs and mediocre outputs. The system is inherently wasteful, but where does that waste reside? And that really ultimately kind of led to this kind of transformation. It's kind of like the matrix. You kind of keep digging around, and suddenly you start to see how all the moving pieces work and where all the dollar flows are and why the systems are so broken. And that ultimately led to the inspiration for One Medical and the idea behind One Medical. Um, what is One Medical for those who are less familiar with it? It's really focused on one thing alone, and it's primary care. Um, we're looking at re-examining the primary care relationship and rebuilding the foundation of what it means to deliver great primary care. Um, different from primary care alone is thinking about it systematically, right? In a complex world today where healthcare is enormously complicated, you can't rely on individuals per se alone. You need to kind of think about the, the healthcare system holistically and how do you systematically support primary care, um, which makes it much more scalable. And there are great pockets of innovation everywhere across the country today in healthcare, and the question is how do you make it more generalizable and scalable? So we thought about those key principles in the design architecture of One Medical. So we took the same kind of original DNA of what it means to be a great clinician. Uh, we took those and took a modern twist to it. Say, so look outside the industry, look at the adjacent industries, and say, what is going on that's creative, innovative, and new that could be applied in concert with the old school values of medicine? And this is the hard part, and this is the part that people underestimate the complexity of this innovation cycle, which is you gotta take those ideas and then you gotta make them work. And making it work in healthcare is a lot more difficult because of the um, unusual economics of how we're paid, right? And so we have to figure out how to make the economics work in addition to the design architecture so they work in concert. And for us, we use technology to help enable that. Technology is the game changer. It is the transformative force that allows you to do different business models, different service models using technology. And obviously, with technology, you get data. And the data helps inform the system more intelligently to redesign and improve on itself. And this system broadly called, is, is broadly called technology-enabled primary care. It's a new model of looking at how to do primary care more effectively and efficiently. Um, what does that look like today, if you're not familiar? Um, embarrassingly, it's kind of what healthcare should be today, but it just is failing to execute because of the system of healthcare. But uh, at the end of the day, it's you know, same day service, it's more time with your physician, so you've got a lot more extended time. The appointments actually start on time. I have to say that because unfortunately most today don't start on time, but we manage against that. Um, it's a coordinated primary care team, so it's a, a, a team-based philosophy of care that's available 24-7 using technology and virtual visits and phone calls. Um, and importantly, we take insurance. We wanted to work within the insurance-based model. We already have enormous dollars working in the insurance-based system, so we wanted to take those dollars and repurpose them and, and make them work better and more effectively for the patient. Um, and this doesn't happen for free. These sound great. They all sound easy, but the execution, particularly within a distorted economic and financing model within healthcare, is not as easy and intuitive as people think. And really what allows us to do a lot of this stuff is technology. And so if you look at the systems that we have applied today in our modern kind of delivery system, we've got you know, scheduling algorithms, workflow algorithms, we automate care whenever we can automate care, we kind of allow the data to exist where it needs to be existed, and then we can allow the teams to work much more collaboratively with this platform. Um, this gives you a sense of kind of how the offices look. If you haven't been to one of our offices, um, everything is value engineered. This may look like an expensive office. It's actually pretty cost competitive, the average traditional doctor's office, right? We just don't buy the off-the-shelf linoleum you know, <laughs> surfaces and the odd cabinets that have nothing in them, right? If you ever go to the doctor's office and open those very expensive cabinets, uh, there's nothing in them besides maybe some old papers. And so we just redesign the whole system thoughtfully around the patient, and you can actually do a lot of value engineering just in the physical space alone. Um, we have an integrated virtual care experience. So if you go on the mobile app, you can kind of submit a request for us. You know, common uh, frequent transactions can be automated through the phone. So if you've got a, a common UTI, you can submit the request. The virtual care team will then take that request, adjudicate it against your allergies and meds, and to send a prescription straight to the pharmacy. So, and this is all kind of covered within the system, so you don't have to pay incrementally for this um, experience within our medical system. The biggest question I get is, you know, there's no way you guys can do this. How do you guys do this? This makes no sense. You know, this looks like 10x more expensive, and it's, it's much more affordable. 
Um, how do you make this work? And what's counterintuitive, again, is even though primary care is generally under reimbursed compared to other specialty care, um, even though people say that it's really um, you know, hard to make ends meet, there is waste within the system. And so what we do is we take a look at that waste and we basically repurpose that. And most of what we do is look at labor costs. And so if you look at the uh, cost of health care, predominantly in a service business, the number one expense is labor. There's lots of other, you know, certainly CapEx and some other facility costs for some of you, but the dominant form of the variable cost for really managing people is labor. And so we look at labor costs, and the average benchmark in most primary care physicians is about four and a half support personnel per, uh, for, per physician. And we, through our technology innovation, have reduced that by two thirds. So our Actual overhead while delivering 5x to 10x the service level is a third of traditional overhead in, in the average doctor's office, and that allows us to then reinvest in time, right? The key ingredient that's missing from the primary care relationship, if you remember that original image, is time. Time to listen, time to educate, time to communicate, time to really understand, time to review all the meds lists, right? Time to call specialists and coordinate care. That ingredient is missing from the primary care system, and frankly, the healthcare system as a whole, and we reinvest the savings in time. Um, that translates, obviously, to great satisfaction. We've got a, a high virality component to our, our patient base um, and a broad demographic base. Um, we, take, we just launched pediatrics, but we take care from pediatrics all the way through seniors. I think our oldest patient is 105. Um, and we also reduce costs, right? So when you have a high access primary care system, you're less likely to use ERs and downstream uh, expensive systems. And so the downstream savings um, from patients actually reduces the cost as well. So the benefit to the model is quality, service, and affordability. Uh, and that's driven um, our popularity across uh, the seven markets that we're in today, um, over 40 facilities, and growing uh, fairly rapidly at this stage. So a lot of people ask, you know, so what's, what's the future of healthcare? I mean, this sounds great, but where are you guys going? And, and how does this really shake out for the rest of the healthcare industry? And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about it, uh, but you know, these are going to be you know, general examples, but I think they're going to be uh, how you interpret them specific to your own uh, instance. But let's kind of put some caveats on this. Uh, the first is a quote, you know, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So keep that as a caveat by, by Niels Bohr, <laughs> very appropriately uh, quoted. Um, and the other one that's an important kind of thematic uh, futuristic lens about how to look at healthcare is uh, from the Institute of the Future. We really tend to kind of overestimate the effects in the short run of technology and underestimate in the long run. And we are at that interesting kind of inflection point within society as we start to look at it. And so those are important things to factor in how you're thinking about where you're going as a healthcare organization, as a healthcare entrepreneurial organization, or an innovator in general. So really kind of, you know, people ask me, well, what should I do, where should we go, how should we kind of adjust to the market? And I can't give any specific, you know, guidance to specific situations. There's so much complexity to dig into any market, but I can give you some general rules of thumb that help at least define how to think about um, your space. Um, one is to look for truisms, right? What are the likely things that are going to be big macro truisms over the next decade um, or two? And I would say that one of the probable truisms that's becoming more truism than not is the Affordable Care Act. I think you know, if you look at fundamental transformation of healthcare, whether you're pro or against, um, the economic reimbursement has definitively changed, right, from volume to value. And to unwind this, I think, is going to be very difficult, even if you are you know, in, a, in the camp that believes that this is going to be repealed. But I think if you talk to most experts, it's going to be very difficult to unwind this. And so at the end of the day, the momentum towards value is really shifting. And so I think this is fairly close to mutable, right? Nothing's 100%. But when you look at the magnitude of effort it took to get the, the Affordable Care Act passed, it's going to be equally effect, uh, difficult to get it. Um, repealed and or modified at a material level that doesn't have the momentum of value already moving in place. And so you have to be thinking about the economic equation. And the prior mantra in healthcare industry experts, right, all of the folks that have been traditionally in healthcare is the status quo is going to be there, right? We've always thought that the status quo was going to be there because any fundamental healthcare reform Everybody preferred status quo. The Affordable Care Act changed that, and the status quo is no longer in place. We have a new status quo, and I think we're going to have to absorb the reality that, that is going to be the future for at least the next 10, 20 years. 
Um, the other truism is kind of unrelated to uh, the economics, but certainly impacts the economics. And that's, you know, the concept of technology, Moore's law, although that's also starting to get a little bit unclear about whether, how long Moore's law will persist. But still, at some fundamental level, the cost of technology continues to go down. The innovative power of technology continues to increase at lower cost. And that leads to this trend line that uh, hopefully some of you guys are aware of in terms of singularity and thinking about this inflection point of technology in society where information flow and the power of technology starts to really supersede that of our individual uh, capacities as humans. And so this uh, inflection point on the innovative capacity of technology is hitting many parts of society. And as you see, both on the technology and the biotech and all the other information service fronts, this is a likely truism to kind of uh, factor into your thinking. So if you kind of take those two macro forces, which are pretty disruptive, fun fundamental payment uh, redesign, and the influx of low-cost technology across any information service or production economy, now you start to look at a real fracturing. If you take a look at the healthcare industry, it's been pretty stagnant financially for the last 50 years. And so you've got this glacial iceberg of, let's call it, institutional knowledge that's been baked for 50 years, right? Two plus trillion dollars over, you know, you know, obviously compounding over 50 years, and now we're starting to see fractures in the system. And we are just in the early days. This is five years after Affordable Care Act, right, plus, and we're now looking at just the early fractures. It's only going to accelerate. And so as you start to think about your organization, you, you really are gonna, ha oh, well, we missed the one slide. <laughs> uh, if you're a fish, which is not showing up there, you'd be jumping from a small uh, bowl to a larger bowl and you'd be making a leap, right? You cannot swim your way out of this. You're going to have to make a leap into a new model, and that's where a lot of the traditional healthcare institutions find themselves. And if you're an innovator, you also find yourself in this transition point. You cannot innovate on the current business model, but that's where all the dollars are. And it's hard to innovate on the future dollar because that is still yet to, to be uh, 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 had. So where you're in this kind of transition point of imagine the goldfish leaping from bowl to bowl, and instead if you're wearing a suit, you're, you're jumping from uh, across a ravine. <laughs> um, anyway, um, what are the kind of the likely pr uh, principles that will help you design across from one uh, transition to the other, I would argue it still is the basics. It's the basics and you have to look at the business model. You have to look at the short-term business model of how you optimize today and the future business model on how you optimize against the future. And there's no easy path necessarily from old to new and I think we find a lot of institutions struggling with that transition. But if you can optimize your current and transition to the future, those are the transition points that we're looking at. If you're an innovator trying to help institutions make that transition, you have to be cognizant of the business model. Where I see great uh, Valley entrepreneurs suffer is they attack it like a consumer model. And healthcare is not a consumer model. It's still not a consumer model. It's an enterprise model. And so you have to look at the enterprise flows and attack it like an enterprise model. And you really have to think about the individual because the market is moving towards the consumer, but the payment methodologies are still institutionally aggregated. And so you have to be sensitive to today's business model, the future business model, and how those transition. I think in the new economy, we're really going to value design, right, where production is commoditized. Um, design becomes a creative order of magnitude of differentiation now. Innovative right brain thinking on top of let's call it commodity production is going to be much more valued and differentiated and relatively at the same price point. The design time is the same, but if you're more creative and more innovative on the same production costs, I think design is going to be differentially valued. And today, at the end of the day, I think we're still humans. We still value a human interaction and human connection that has to do with humanity, hospitality, service. And you can still differentiate on service. If you look at some of the great hospitality models in our current economy outside of healthcare, it's still to be improved upon, right? I don't think that uh, there is an organization at a national level or an international level that has gotten hospitality locked in. So there's still a huge opportunity for hospitality innovation um, outside of healthcare, and one could argue even much more of an opportunity within healthcare. And for models like ourselves that are innovative in hospitality, we really focus on hospitality and the service mindset. And it's not easy to do, but when you add it to healthcare, it feels 
10x more important than if you're checking in at a hotel. So, and no, no offense to Chip, but I mean, those are just the experiences that um, really matter to people. And if you can add humanity to a healthcare experience, it's a really powerful opportunity. So I think that's kind of it outside of maybe this one last quote, which is, um, you know, everybody talks about creativity and they overvalue creativity. I think this is one of my favorite quotes because people underestimate you have to actually do the work, you have to actually push through the constraints, and that's what real innovation is. Creativity, you know, you get that for free. Um, but actually doing something innovative, you gotta put some work against the constraints. Um, and hopefully you guys hold, the, hold that power to kind of control your future, whether you're a startup, we're an established uh, you know, uh, facility or uh, currently in the healthcare space as it is. There's lots of opportunity to be had and uh, welcome kind of your thoughts. That was awesome. Um, okay, I'm just gonna grab this, just gonna grab this microphone. Um, perfect, perfectly done, thank you. Yep. Um, so we're gonna have time for a bit of Q and A. We've got a few minutes I think before you've got to, Got to rush off. Uh, I just, if I could first just sort of ask you, how long is it going to be before you are irrelevant because everything is here in my phone and I'm going to be able to speak to my doctor remotely. It's going to tell, tell me if I'm ill or if I need, well, is, that, is that a pipe dream or is it coming in the next couple of years? Uh, did you ask how long we're irrelevant? No, will it be in the industry, oh. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean, I think um, uh, a couple things. Uh, brick and mortar is still gonna have a role, there's no question, right? And then the question is, and, and frankly, people will still have a role, and it's increasingly diminished with technology, but um, how you leverage those assets are much more important. So for instance, with us, you know, we're doing virtual care 24 seven today, uh, adding video capability is fairly easy to do, so, so that, let's call it technology, that capability exists today, it's relatively affordable, um, how it extends the business model is a different issue, right? And so um, for us, we look at it much more holistically. We use that as one channel among many, and the brick and mortar supports the virtual and, and vice versa. So those are necessary evils today because of reimbursement, right? Reimbursement today is still uh, facility driven and not virtually. But over time, as the economics change, I think we become agnostic to technology or not. The reality is that you know different individuals will choose different channels, and so we're a multi-channel strategy. We allow people to use phone, uh, you know, snail mail, uh, email, uh, in-office visits, video visits, and otherwise. We don't uh, kind of, if we're really kind of patient-centered, we assume that people have different preferred modalities of connecting to us, and we want to allow multi-modality connect connectivity. So we're somewhat agnostic to what channel people use, and so we have seniors that you know will call us physically and or walk in the office, and we'll have um, you know young hipsters who just never want to talk to us and just text us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such a novel concept to be able to email your doctor yeah. and get a response, it's wonderful. So we have a couple of people, uh, the microphones, if you want to uh, raise your arm, we have a question right here. Scott uh, has got a microphone. We also have a standing mic which you can go towards. So we're gonna first ask uh, in the red, Barbara, and then go to the standing mic. If you could just briefly introduce yourself and then ask a question. Hi, I'm Barbara Burgess from Pathways Home Health and Hospice. And Tom, I was wondering about um, your thoughts on home visits. Home visits? Home visits. Yep. So some of the seniors, that's their way of connectivity. Yep. Uh, I personally am a radical believer in home visits. The main issue is the payment architecture around that. But if you can get the payment architecture around that, I think that's just the reality of where I think healthcare will be. And I don't think it's that far away. I think, you know, there are great ways to do that payment aggregation today. We're looking at that space thoughtfully, and there's lots of ways to, um, let's, let's call it address that um, model, just because the economics of it are so inverted if you go into the institution, that, um, and, and so much more care is desired at home and otherwise. So I think it's a huge opportunity, and it's just an issue of aggregating the right payments holistically, right? That's the key. If it's piecemeal, it doesn't work. And that's the problem, as we all know, is the piecemeal payments don't justify some of these innovations. The global, the global payment architectures allow you to be much more creative with higher risk populations. And so that really is kind of, um, I think, the, the, the model for innovation that funds the innovation and then hopefully generalizes to the broader population. Thanks, uh, Richard. Richard Adler from the Institute for the Future. It's nice to see the quote from my old boss, Roy Amar. 
Uh, question about economics. Uh, you indicated that overall there's about an 8% savings um, reduction in costs. Who captures those? Does that show up in your margins, or is it a kind of virtuous contribution to the overall healthcare costs? Yeah, so it depends on where the payment's aggregated today. So right now that accrues to the payer, which in theory should you know, then re result in premium reduction at scale, right? Uh, long term, obviously, we're working with the ultimate purchase of healthcare, so those premiums should get driven down. So our goal is to drive the premiums down. We think that at minimum premiums should be able to stay flat, but we actually think that premiums should be driven down over time. And um, so it depends on kind of philosophically how people want to drive it. You can actually uh, level off premiums and cover more people, or you could drive premiums down, or you can do more innovative care and service around that. So our goal is to continue to drive premiums down. Um, as best we can, and we partner with you know employers, payers, you know the ultimate purchasers to kind of figure out that model. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Question in the back. Could you introduce yourself? <clears throat> Good morning. Hi, my name is John Whitman. I'm with the Wharton School. Um, I, I totally believe in the model you're doing. But one quick: um, about 10 years ago, I did a project for a hospital that was looking at the nurse practitioner doc in the box clinics, the the CVSs of the world. And the hospital's primary care docs thought this was the death of primary care. I mean, they just were totally opposed to it. And obviously, they were wrong. But the one issue they raised I still think has le legitimacy is the liability issues. And how do you prevent missing something in a phone call that otherwise could have gotten picked up in an actual visit? And again, I'm not justifying. I think what we're doing is the right path. But that is a legitimate concern. And how are you addressing that? as you meet with, visit people virtually and diagnose their issues? Yeah, a couple things. I think um, a few things. Um, you are missing one input if you're talking to people on the phone, right? So uh, a lot of care today is delivered on the phone. So we look at kind of community standards and whether this is at a minimum above the community standard. So if you think about it, if people don't have access to care in general, that's not so great. Uh, if they're doing phone-based consultation, a video-based consultation is superior than a phone-based consultation. When you add vital signs to the video visit, which are very doable, now you're getting more data input. So um, I think regardless of the fidelity and number of, of let's call it media inputs you have to any communication channel, I think the clinician always has to say, do I have enough information to have a confident diagnosis and or am I not going to miss and hazardous condition. And that's true of any clinician encounter, right? You may be missing an important data point in an office visit because of the family, you know, isn't there. And so there are many aspects to a, a good clinician having the right clinical environment with the right incentives to deliver the best care regardless of channel um, that is factored into how we manage it. Um, and, you know, from what we've seen, you know, it, it, you know uh, th that's our primary focus, is to take great, great care of patients regardless of the channel. And if they're in the wrong channel, we encourage them to switch to the other channel. Hi, I'm Minda Guhab from Peak Focus on, in the Startup Showcase. Um, One Medical is really cool. And we really, I'm proud to say that I've been a member since 2010. So our company is now helping seniors be cooler than their grandkids. Um, now, one thing with the savings that you have is you're implementing technology and design, which is amazing. Now, what's missing to me is how do you effectively implement technology in such an old space where old technologies have been used? And I'm curious to know how you have um, delivered really great implementation of technology that fits into the current model that people are using. Yep. Yeah, so that's part of the issue. It's easy to get distracted by the technology, right? The technology, the technology, and you look at the technology and then try to figure out something. It's better to look at the patient and the population and say, what problem are you trying to solve? And then more often than not, it's still a labor issue. Healthcare is still predominantly a people-driven business. So the vast majority of care and the vast majority of experiences that people have are with our individuals, our providers, our, our administrative assistants. So the, the, the touch point is still the humans, but the technology enables a different um, labor equation. And, and that's the key hidden thing that people don't see is when you look at the workflow of a traditional primary care office, there's so much mundane stuff that doesn't go to the right individual. And so we reallocate those mundane tasks to the right pool of labor so that you're freeing up 
the most important folks, which are the providers, to have more time with patients. And so what's hidden is the technology enablement is behind the scenes, but it now allows our providers to perform as more human, right? More connected, more time with um, patients. So that's one aspect of it. There is a separate component which we're continuing to invest in now. And it depends on the demographic, right? You have to be very conscious of the demographic you're serving from a patient perspective on how the technology fits within their lives now. So if, if they are an avid mobile phone user and highly transactional, then a mobile phone environment's gonna be perfect for them and they can do all their prescription rules and otherwise. If you've got a senior who's got maybe, let's call it, less of an affinity for their phone, not ability to do all the transactions or desire to do the transactions, you have to come up with what technology is helpful for that. And you know, remote monitoring access is, I think, kind of one of the obvious things. There's some innovative companies that we've seen out there. But I think that's kind of an, a relatively kind of clean space to think about, which is passive monitoring to enable alerts. Um, so you've got to think about the context as much as the technology. Um, I don't know if that helps, but you know. Uh, as a former primary care physician, I am very excited about your model, and I'll visit the Noe Valley Clinic next week. However, my question has to do, how do you interface with what is really the most expensive component of health care, and that is hospital care? Do your physicians have hospital privileges? Do you make rounds? How do you relate to the patients when they're in that environment? Yeah, so that's a function for us of scale. So at the right scale, we're going to design pre and post acute systems. Um, but that's not, you know, you have to be somewhat focused in your early stages of a startup. So we're mostly focused on the outpatient and upstream from that. But we're now starting to look at downstream and how do we manage the downstream experience thoughtfully. We're not. Um, uh, intending to be specialty or hospital care systems, we interface with those because the clinical expertise is fantastic there, but the operational movement of patients and the information flows is really clunky. And so what we're doing is designing those programs in concert with hospital institutions and specialty institutions to better manage those handoffs thoughtfully, but that's an innovation space that we're looking at prospectively, not, um, we're not currently doing it actively today. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned the pace or the, you mentioned the change from uh, volume to value. And uh, you know, I've been involved in healthcare a long time, and there seems to be some real fits and starts. I mean, do you, do, you, do you really do see the pace of the Accountable Care Act, and maybe in its evolutionary form, and there's a lot of politics around it, but do you see that pace continuing towards a real value relationship? I mean, it's really related to the question you just got about all the other pieces of the healthcare model. Uh, we are in conversations with almost every purchasing entity of healthcare, and uh, you cannot escape the first order stuff, which is ACO and bundled payments, which is already in motion, and you know it's got mixed results. But I think the desire is not to say, well, the mixed results is going to make us stop. The, the the barrier against some of the ACO findings is actually resulting in people looking for more disruptive <laughs> value solutions because they're hitting rate limiting steps against the current institution. So um, I think that pressure and desire is strongly there. The question is what opportunities exist on the other side. And right now there are not that many opportunities that exist for, de for delivering scalable value. So I think the rate limiting step is not desire. I think if you look at you know, all the uh, Medicare language that's coming out of CMS and otherwise in terms of you know, percent of value-based reimbursement, I think uh, at least from a desire and intent on the payment side, it's there. The question is, are the providers uh, developing quickly enough to feed that much more disruptive thing? I mean, I can tell you that we're in pretty deep conversations for a lot of these things, and other institutions are starting to form. And, and it's, it's, you know, when you shift the payment model, I mean, I, you can point to any part of the market, and you're seeing value-based companies starting from scratch that are just starting to take market share. Um, and we're talking about, you know, end of life care and all the other kind of aspects. So it's, it's happening, but, you know, it's so big, you're not going to see it. It's the fractures in the ice still. Um, but, you know, I, it's hard for me to think it's not going to be, you know, it's five to ten years. It's, you know, it's a progression, but, yeah. Right. Well, unfortunately, yeah. we've got to wrap it up there. But as yeah. expected, a provocative and, thought and, and wonderful talk. Thanks very much, Tom. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you.